Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. It's a story that would go on to change the world, but it happened so long ago that we forget. You know, the same way you can forget what you got last Christmas. And yet here we are, the same thing year after year. We decorate, we rush, we shop, we wrap, we open, we invite, we attend, we eat, we celebrate, we box it all up, wait 12 months, and we do it again. But there's more to the story, more than a tree, more than gifts, and more than just another holiday. And we all want there to be more to this season. The thing is, God knew that. In fact, that was his plan all along. He wants us to have more, more joy, more peace, more of Him. He gave us the perfect gift, and it wasn't wrapped neatly under a tree. The gift He gave wasn't a virgin mother or wise men. It wasn't angels, a star, or a manger. The gift He gave was and is the person of Jesus, fully God, but completely human. The gift was that He clothed Himself in humanity and embarked on a rescue mission, one that would give hope to all mankind, and the story that would change the world forever began like this. <laughs> Wasn't that fun? No, oh, I, I love watching kids sing. There's nothing more joyful than that. Well, welcome to Vineyard Community Church, and we are in a series called God's Gift to You, and today we're going to unpackage the gift of joy, Okay. And so that's what we're going to talk about. You know, when I watch the kids uh, singing and the Christmas uh, program and stuff like that, I can't help but think back about <laughs> my kids. You know, they're all grown now. But when they were little, nothing brought me more joy than to go to their Christmas concerts. Well, most times. <laughs> you know, I'm reminded of this one time when, uh, when we had a Christmas concert and uh, you know, this one was special because I have the three boys, and it's when they were little. They were five, six, and eight. Very close, right? And so they were in a Christian private school that we had sent them to, and there was a Christmas concert, and all three of them were going to sing, and I was so excited, you know, for that to happen. And at this school, they, they were going to take all the K through sixth graders, which is about 300 kids, right, to do this concert to sing. And so I couldn't wait to be there, and of course, all, neither could all the other parents and the grandparents and all. So they were going to perform for about 800 people, right, these little guys. And so they asked us to dress our kids up, because they had practiced really hard for months on this. So they asked us to dress our children up, you know, in our Christmas attire, like kind of like you saw the little guys up here today, right? So I took my three boys, and I put them in the little, you know, khaki pants, right? And, uh, and the uh, Christmas little shirt with the little tie on it. Now, let me tell you, as we were getting ready, um, my boys were pretty good about it, you know, for the most part. Samuel, who, who was uh, going in that third grade, it was about eight, he'd done this gig a couple of times. He's like, okay, here, just put the tie on, Dad, right? And uh, my middle son, Jeremiah, who at the time was six, well, as we were getting ready, he's like, oh, I don't know why you're making me sing to people I do not know <laughs> and why you have to wear this and it's choking me, <laughs> you know, the tie. Men are probably going, amen, kid. I know how he feels, right? You know, and so he was protesting. And then our little one, David, who was five, going in kindergarten, right? We called him baby David. So I was getting him ready, you know, and just do his little hair. He's so cute back then. And so I was talking to him and he looked at me and goes, Mom, it doesn't feel right to make kids go to school at night, <laughs> you know, and stuff. So anyway, so I made them all get in the car, and Andy, and we ran over to the school and, you know, put the kids with their teachers. And, of course, we wanted to get front row and center, right? We had our whole posse, and we took up the front rows. And, you know, so we get there. Andy had his camcorder, you know, <laughs> back then. He's going to get his prodigy. You know, he wants to, wants to videotape everything, doesn't want to miss anything. So he's down there. We're so excited. Well, the kids start to file in, and their stage there was huge. They have, it was a Baptist school, so they had these, 
high rises that their choir sang on that literally just ran the gamut of their, um, of their backdrop. And so each kid would come in, you know, with their class, and the older ones would take the positions at the top, and then they would work down, right? And so uh, Samuel's age group came in, and lo and behold, they stopped like in the middle there, right? And so Samuel's like right in the middle of the, the shot, and I'm like, well, that's cool. And then comes Jeremiah's class, and he lines up, and he's right behind his brother, right in front of his brother. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, God, you're so good, right? And then here comes baby David, and he's like right off to the side. And so I've got him like stair steps, and, you know, right there, my three little angels, oh, right? So they start singing, and, and it's so exciting, you know, and they get to the first, the second song, and I'm like, oh, yay, you know. And uh, then all of a sudden, the, this is where it all went wrong, though. <laughs> Because the principal walks out, he's going to give a few brief, brief announcements. So, yeah. So he starts to talk. That's their cue. Uh, the oldest one reaches over and he says something to the, to the middle one that was six. He didn't like it. He turned around and just pushed him. <laughs> of course, he falls into the bigger kids behind him, right? And there's a domino effect. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You know, and while this is going on, right, you can see all the teachers, like, move in, and they've got that glare. Kid, if you ever want, you know, recess, you better knock it off. <laughs> you know, and they all kind of straighten up, and I think, whew, disaster avoided, right? That's what I'm thinking. Well, they, they break into the next song. It's called Silent Night. Well, they're up there singing Silent Night. Well, the oldest one didn't like being shoved, so he just, like, Silent Night, and he pinches his brother. <laughs> Well, the six-year-old's not having any of that. He was trying to go, I'm going to get you, you know, just so, so loud. And I'm like, I'm sitting there, I'm mortified now. I'm like, you know, like you watch a horror movie and you're like, no, and you can't do anything about it, right? Because it's all, all this stuff is going on. And I'm like looking for Andy, like you fix it, <laughs> you know, and he's got sheer panic on his face, just like me. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord. And all that joy I felt just melted away into dread. And now I'm looking for the nearest exit. I'm thinking, if I could just get out of here, be okay. But if you remember, I position myself in the middle, right, of these pews. I cannot get away. And I'm thinking, okay. And now I can hear the whispers. Whose child is that? <laughs> Whose kids are that? And I'm thinking, oh, God, oh, God. You know, I'm slipping down, right? I am just, like I said, mortified. And so I'm just waiting. And then the teacher, thank God, the music teacher, she was able to pull it together <laughs> to get the kids to finish this song. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, my gosh. So the kids are walking out, right? And so then, then baby David, he knows where I'm at because I made a big fuss when he came in because his first concert to stand up and wave and all that. So he sees me, locks eyes, and he goes, I told you it's a bad idea to come at night. <laughs> you know, and he yells it out to me, and I'm thinking... Great, great, right, right. The school remembers the Meads, by the way. <laughs> they have not forgotten. Listen, to me, nothing brings me more joy than, than at Christmas time watching children because you never know what's going to happen. It's a surprise every time. All right, well, it's also amazing to me how fast joy can just melt away, right? When the situations change, you know, and then, and then joy is robbed from you, it's kind of like, did I even feel happy at any point here? <laughs> Was I joyful? Because it can go away. Yet the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, always be joyful, always be joyful. So God wants that from us. He wants us to walk in this state of joy. He's given it to us as a gift that we are to unpackage, right? And so it has to go beyond our circumstances. That is what I want to talk to you guys about tonight. Uh, why don't you just bow your heads with me, and I'm going to open and ask the Holy Spirit to come. Thank you, Father. Lord, there is none like you. And so, Holy Spirit, which is your presence, I ask that you would just fill every nook and cranny in this room, Lord God, and that your word would be heard, Father. Yes, Lord, I would ask that you remove all distractions, that we might be keenly focused on what it is that you have for us today. Father, we need you. I need you. Come, Father, empower this message. Empower me, Father, and empower the ones that will hear what your Spirit is saying to carry out the message that you give us today. I love you, Father. You're invited here in all 
what, whatever you want to do, Lord, you just come in and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now today, I asked uh, our worship leader, Hannah, you know, if she would sing Joy to the World, right? And so we started this morning uh, worshiping with Joy to the World, and it's one of my favorite Christmas songs, you know, at this time of the year. And when it says Joy to the World, it's not just for some people, it's for everybody, and it's everywhere that we should feel this joy. But there's so much going on in our world that it almost kind of suppresses that. It feels like we can't really have, possibly have joy to the world, that it, it cannot happen. And so I wanted to just briefly kind of look at that for a moment. It's on your outline. What keeps me and you from seeking joy, the possibility of it? Well, first, it's because the bad that shouldn't happen happens. It happens, and it happens a lot. And I have, I'm the first to admit that a lot of difficult or bad things that happen to me are results of my poor choices, okay? But there are things that happen to us that we have no hand in at all. It just kind of happens to us, and we think, oh, that's unfair, right? And when you turn the TV on and you listen, we're bombarded with the bad news that's going on. I was thinking just before it came, something that was on that I was praying about was this news where you have this young man, this young white man that goes into a church that's predominantly black, and he proceeds to shoot people as they're having a Bible study, right? And I look and I think, you've got to be kidding. That's so wrong. That's the bad stuff that should never happen. And so we wonder sometimes, we're left wondering, is there a possibility to have this joy in all the earth when we see stuff like that? And then it tends to be that the good things that we want to happen often don't, yeah. right? That the good that should happen, it just doesn't. I mean, you're trying really hard to follow Christ and you're lining up your behaviors and you're going after what he's asked you to do. And so you're praying for your finances, for relationships, you know, for your health, right? And for these things that are good and yet nothing happens. And you're wondering what's going on here. So you take that, the bad th situations that are going on in the world and the fact that you're praying for good things and they're not happening and that sets you up to really to question the whole possibility, could joy ever really happen, right? Can it happen in my life? Can it happen in the world at large? And so there's this, this uh, imprinting that takes place on us because of these factors that makes us want to have this propensity, this leaning towards being discouraged, you know? And we have a lot to be discouraged about or to be angry because there's so much that we see in social misjustice that, that you want to have that leaning or to be even a cynical person, that we would choose those options. But here you go, Christmas. Christmas is all about God breaking into our world and giving us his son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I can choose to be joyful. Yeah. It's a choice that we're going to make. So how do we do that? Well, what I want to do is I want to go back to the very first Christmas, and I want to see how the shepherds in the fields in Bethlehem, when they received this message of joy, how did they respond? What did they do? What are the choices? To me, they were very simple choices, choices that you and I can make uh, and do in our own lives that would help us to, to find this joy that God has brought us. So on your outline, let's take a look at those. The first one is to choose to hear the good news. The shepherds chose to hear the good news. We choose to hear the good news, right? Now, here's a go. Let me do this. Have you... Have you ever had an incident where you felt kind of like kind of down in the dumps, right? And then your phone rings and you answer it and it's somebody with some really good news, right? What happens to you emotionally? You kind of perk up, right? Joy kind of enters into your, your life, you got like this burst of joy. Well, that's because you got good news. That's the power of good news in somebody's life. That's kind of what happened to the shepherds of this first Christmas. Look at this scripture with me in Luke 2.10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. You see that? So this great news is coming. It's not just for the, the shepherds. It's for all of us. And this great news is going to produce the joy, right? Now, when I look at this scripture, I see, <laughs> I got an imagination. I see the shepherds, right? They're like blue collar workers. They're hanging out in the field. They're watching these sheep. Now, sheep are not exciting at all, right? Would you give me that? 
And so they're out there watching them at night. means they're watching them sleeping. So they're just it's very ho-hum, very ordinary, right? Ordinary people, ordinary job. And so they're sitting there, and all of a sudden, God breaks in. And he brings this message of joy to them. Where they are, right there where they are, the ordinary lives. Listen, I believe in my prayer time, that's God, God wants to do that for you. He wants to break in in December the 11th today to bring you joy. He wants to bring you joy in your life. You know, in your ordinary life, the things you've been doing day after day after, he wants to break in and say, hey, I have a message of joy for you. Will you accept it? Now, this message of joy that we're talking about, right, this is about the good news. It's hooked up. Joy is hooked up to having the good news. So you have to ask yourself then, what is the good news? Well, the good news is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about how God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to earth to tell us, to tell us what? To tell us that Father God loves us, that he has a plan and a purpose for our lives, that we matter to him. And he came to tell us, you know, Jesus came to give us this good news that he will forgive us our sins, that he will partner up with us in our difficulties, that he sees who we are and that he loves us. And it makes all the difference in the world when we can hear the good news. In Romans 1.16, it says this, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is God's powerful method of bringing all who believe it to heaven. Now, anyone is, everyone is invited. Now, anyone is invited to come to God in this same way. Invited. That's what's sticking out at me. So circle that invited. So to me, the good news is all about God's invitation to you. His invitation where he's calling out. He's actually reaching out like you can see me reaching. That's God. God is reaching out to you. He wants to, to grab hold of you. And I kind of think it like, it like this. He sent you a text. Dear so-and-so, right? He's talking to you. That's what I see with Christmas messages about the God's invitation. And I see it where he's, he's called some of you on the phone. You know, I got good, I got good news for you, Sam. I got, I got great news for you, Mary. I got... Jaquana, I want to talk to you. Only some of you have not answered that call. You, you've heard it, but you've not answered it, right? And so today, I'm going to encourage you to answer it. Christmas is all about God calling out to you to tell you the good news. That's what it is. And we respond to that call. And when we respond to it, what does it look like? It looks like this. It says, Father God, I know that you are calling to me, and I hear you. And I want to respond back to you. So I accept your son as my savior. And I ask you to forgive me, Jesus, for the things that I have chosen. Right? So simple. And then Jesus, the best way I know how, would you be my CEO? Would you be the leader of my life? Right? So that's how we say that we acknowledge that we heard the good news. Now, there are some of you that are sitting here and you're going, I'm not sure it's good news for me though, Sharon. If I, like, let God in and have this relationship, what would he say? He sees everything that I do. It might not be good news. Well, I want to dispel that because God only has good news for you, right? It's good news. He just wants you to know that he cares deeply for you and that he loves you and that you matter. You matter to him. And so, again, I want to encourage you to respond to that call. And for those of you that have never responded, right, or you feel very distant from God, then I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of my time talking with you to pray and to, and to answer that call with him. Begin that dialogue, and I'll help you to do that. Now, the shepherds did that. They heard the call, and then look, let's look at what they did next, right? The next thing they do is they chose to do what God said. They chose to do what God said. You know, God told him, the shepherds that they were to go and to find the baby, and we all hear this every Christmas, right? The baby that's wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Well, the shepherds actually did this. They obeyed and they go to find. Look in Luke 2.15. When the angel had left them and went into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go, circle that, let's go. You see action there. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so now these shepherds, they're moving towards it. They're moving towards doing this thing that they heard God. Now, why are they in movement? Because they believe the message. They believed and they decided to, to take him up on his offer and go see. 
And I just wonder, guys, what if, what if the shepherds hadn't, d- hadn't done that? What if they go like, whoa, that's a cool experience, but let's sit around in, in this, these fields in Bethlehem. Let's just talk about it. Can God really move this way? <laughs> you know, did we really hear him? If we leave, you know, it's a pretty far walk to Bethlehem. So that might mean that, that we would lose some revenue and definitely lose our time. And oh my gosh, what if we like all eat something really bad and like, you know, like maybe that wasn't true, then what would other people say about us, right? The shepherds could have done that. The shepherds could have stayed inside the fields in Bethlehem and discussed it for years, but they did not. They did not. And if they had, they would have missed what God wanted to do. And figuratively, I think that we have a propensity to stay in our fields in Bethlehem, that when God calls us to trust him, to follow him, when God says, trust me in that relationship, when God says, trust me with your finances, that we tend to be, we're in this, this field, which we're going to call Bethlehem, and we're there and we're sitting and going, Dude, is it really God talking to me now? Is that really God? Yeah. And so you start to hang there and you're questioning And I want to encourage you that it's never too late to trust him. Even today, you can get up from the field that you're in and go in the direction that he has given you, right? You can trust him today with your relationship. You can trust him today to talk to you. You don't have to wonder about this, right? Christmas is all about doing what God has put in your heart to do. And when you follow after that, like the shepherds, that's where the joy comes up. It's in the obedience of following what God has said to you in your heart. In Psalm 19.8, it says this, The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing, watch this, joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are clear, giving insight to life. And so you want joy, then you follow his commandments. But a couple of weeks ago, I know when I mentioned Ten Commandments, you could just feel the oxygen in the room go, right? They're pretty intense. I mean, when I talk about Ten Commandments, is joy bubble up inside? Not for most people. They think restrictive. They think even if they're good, they think they're hard and they're difficult, right? That's what the natural tendency to go there. But let me say this. God gave us those commandments. God gave us, gave us the Bible because he made you. He knows how you're wired up. He didn't come to give you those, his word to make your life a bummer, right? To ruin your life. No. He knows what you need, and so he gives you these guidelines and says, hey, if you live according to this, this set of, of ways, it's like guide rails, and you can color in there, then your life will be full of joy, right? You'll find that joy that you so seek when you follow his word and you obey it. Now, very impassioned about this obedience call, right? Every morning I get up, and it's my practice, and I've talked to you often about it, where I like to go before the Lord, have my cup of coffee, go find my quiet place. I open my Bible and I start to talk to the Lord. I have my journal. And so there's this dialogue that goes on between him and I. And one of the things that I have often asked him is, do you want me to do anything, Lord? What is it that you want Sharon me to do? And when I put that out a couple of, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I guess it's been months now, uh, what came back to me was something that kind of stunned me, right? And whenever I ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? And I hear something, my tendency is to say, does it line up with God's word, right? And if it's a big thing, I still, and I invite other Christ followers into that story, into what I hear God saying, to see indeed if there's a balance. Now, this is what's happened a couple of months ago. Uh, God did say to me to do something, He said, I want you to do something about the uh, renovation loan that you have. You know, that $159,000 that I was bringing to you weeks and weeks ago, right? The giving plan. Well, in my time of talking to him and asking him, he said, I want you to bring that to the people, right? And I said, what? (laughs) What? You know, and he goes, yeah, I want you to bring it before the people and lay it there because I want to build their faith. I'm like, God, unless you didn't get the memo, I talked to the board, (laughs) You know, and I told them, this is what we're going to do about midsummer. You know, I said, oh, we'll just, you know, get a loan and we'll pay the penalties because we didn't finish that. And then we'll just carry it on to 217. I know that 2017, I know we'll get it done, right? 
So I've already agreed with my board to do that. But then I had this, the Lord asking me to do this. And so I'm sitting there. I wish I could say it was a great response, but I wasn't. I was arguing with them. I was like, do you realize this is Christmas, right? Thanksgiving, that this is not a good time, right? So I'm arguing, and then I hear that quiet little voice inside, which I know to be the Lord, and he said, Sharon, whenever they say my name, he says my name, I know to listen, right? He says, Sharon, obey me. And I'm like, oh, snap, dag, right? Well, I, I didn't want to hear that, so I closed down that prayer, all right? Moved over to my Bible, and I'm thinking, I'll just study his word, you know? <laughs> yeah, that'll be good. And, and I remember being in 1 Corinthians, right? And so I'm reading in 1 Corinthians, and all of a sudden, <laughs> in the words start to jump off at the page that talks about, do not hold on to man's wisdom, but seek after God's wisdom where the power is. And I start going, oh, you're killing me, God. You're killing me here, right? And so I closed up my study, and I went into the room, you know, because Andy was in there. And uh, I walked in there, and I said, okay, this is what's happening, you know? And so I told him, he goes, ooh, sounds like the Lord. You have a problem. <laughs> I'm like, thank you very much, sir, right? So I got to my office. I called the board, uh, the, the member that helps me to run the day-to-day -day finances and decisions. And I talked to her, and I said, hey, listen, this is what's happened. You know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm rolling the, the story, and she's very quiet. And I'm thinking, she thinks I'm nuts. She's thinking, I, I, you are so far out. And I start to get that angst when I'm saying it. And so I'm like, well, it's, I know it might not be financially prudent, so maybe we could. And I start babbling about different things we could do, <laughs> just in case I'm wrong, right? And stuff. And then all of a sudden, she breaks in, and she goes, no. No, stop right there, right? So I think, oh, I'm going to get scolded or something. And she goes, you're not going to believe this. She goes, about a month earlier, she goes, God was talking to me about this, but I know we had made a decision as a board to go this direction. She goes, so I have been in prayer about this. Yes, he's talking to you. We need to do this. And then she sent over that afternoon a copy of her journal because she prays and she has a journal. And in the journal was the very same things he was talking to me about. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a confirmation. And then I still, because I want to make sure because it's a big endeavor, I brought it to my pastoral staff, which I love, and they're all so diverse in the, in the areas and in personalities, and they were of one accord. They said, yeah, we believe this is God, right? So that obedience to bring to you and say, hey, here's where we are. Now, to be faithful to tell you where you guys are, you are $26,522 collected, right? That's what we've got. We still need $122,500. A lot of money, right? But I wanted to tell you that, and I wanted to tell you that's due in December, the end of December. Now, I have been talking to you about that, and then last week, and this is interesting, last week I had a young lady come up, a young woman come up to me, and uh, she, she said, hey, I want to give you something. She goes, these are my sneaker monies. I was going to buy shoes, right? And so she goes, here it is. It was $300. And I said, well, good, put it in a envelope mark on there you know for the building campaign and let's go ahead and put it over there but as we talked she goes but she goes yeah yeah I got that I'm going to do that but I wanted to ask you a question I said yeah she goes so Sharon what happens if you don't get the money and I thought but we're going to get the money because the Lord said to go this way I'm pretty sure we're going to get that money and she said no she goes I get it you have faith but what if it's not there on December 31st and I thought about it and you guys all probably think it's deep down inside and I'm like yeah <laughs> right yeah and so you know I thought about it and I thought well these this house is God's house I know that these are God's people and I know that and I am a servant I know that 100% and I can't do anything but follow my Lord wherever he says. And I know I live in a world where things don't always work out, but I can't be bothered about that. I can only follow my father's leadings, right? And then we'll see what happens. I'm sure he'll tell me what to do if I arrive there. He'll have the ticket to where I go next because that's the way he works. Guys, 
I'm sure when I'm talking to you about Christmas message that the angels, when they announced to the shepherds what was going on, the shepherds didn't understand everything. They did not. But the little that they understood, they acted on it. And I think that's what God wants from us. The little that we understand, the little that we think we're hearing from him to move on, I think that's where the pleasure is. That's where we, we obey his, his, what he asks us to do and that's where the joy comes up. After talking to that young lady, I felt energized because I knew I was following my father. That's what we do. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to, you know, to make other people's decisions. We're only called to make our own decisions and what God would have for us. And I believe the shepherds did that. I believe in my story I did that. I, I have the joy of the Lord no matter what my circumstances I might face, right? All right. So joy comes from hearing the good news. Joy also comes from doing what God tells us to. And then the last thing the shepherds did that I think we can do is to choose to tell someone else. To choose to tell somebody else what? The good news. The good news. That's what the shepherds did. We see in Luke 2, 17, when they've, uh, when they've seen him, which is the baby Jesus, they spread the word concerning what they had been told or told them because... Oh boy, my reading this morning. When they seen him, which is baby Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. I'm trying to get that out. Okay, so what happens here is that these shepherds that see the baby, they remember what's been told of, him, of them. And so now they're running. They're telling their, they're telling their family. They're telling their friends, their coworkers, their neighbors. They're going out and they're just telling as many people as they possibly can. I believe that we should be doing that also. I think we should tell people about who Jesus is. Tell them about the good news. Tell them about the night that you don't have to be, you know, a, a philosopher or a theologian. You just tell what's happened to you, right? The night and day difference that he made in your life. And so we should be telling. We have this message and telling is an action. We go out and we tell people. And if you remember what Christ has done for you, and I do that, when I sit and I think about what he has done for me, the salvation he has brought me, the crap he pulled me up and out of, oh man, I can't wait to tell people that, people especially that I love and I care about, right? That's what we should be doing, telling our families and, and, and different things like that. You know, there's a joy that happens when we do that also. We recount what's happening in our salvation and I was thinking about this whole idea of telling and how joy comes up and how strength comes in. And I was thinking about a funeral that I was part of a couple of weeks ago of, of a, a long-term member. She passed away. And, and uh, my pastors, because, you know, with Andy's uh, being out, my pastors actually did the service. And I can remember sitting right back there and watching and just kind of praying for the, for the family. And so the husband gets up to do the eulogy of his wife that had been married for 37, I mean, you know, 47, 48 years, a long time, right, long time. So he gets up, and, you know, that, that's kind of hard. They help him up, and I'm thinking, oh, right? So he comes to the front, he stands by the casket, and he starts to tell about his wife. He starts to tell about how he met her, how he was so smitten, how he courted her, how he asked her to marry him, you know, and then they got married and the, the gifts that God had given them with the children and their beautiful life together. And I actually watched a transformation as he was speaking, the joy of his love for his wife come over him. And so I watched him with such strength and such poise. And then it reminded me of the principle of joy. When you tap into joy, and you bring back those memories and those things, you can't contain joy. It just kind of spills out. And it gave him the strength to probably face what I would consider one of the hardest things that we have to do, which is to stand by somebody we love when they pass away. Now, Psalm 107, 22 says this, with joy, they should tell what he has done. So it's your joy. Tap into the joy of your salvation when you share Tell somebody. Let them know what God has done for you, right? And I made it real easy for you to do that because last week I gave you invite cards to the Christmas Eve service, right? Yeah, I did, hopefully. <laughs> if you don't have them, you can get them. I didn't get enough, yeah. So you can get them at the information table. You'll want to get those. I'm hoping that you see 
that you and I have been given the awesome privilege as Christ followers to partner up with God and to go and find that which is lost or that which is far from God, right? That we get to do that is so, it's, it's one of the greatest things that we get to do to partner up with God, in my opinion. So we get to, uh, to go and to look for people. And so I want to, I gave you that card, so you put it in your pocket, put it in your wallet or your purse, whatever, but take it with you and then start to ask God, say, God, open up my eyes. Let me see in my coworkers or my friends or the school, you know, my neighbors, who can I give this card to? And then proceed to give it to them, pray about it, and then give them that card. Now, let me tell you a little secret that I know. This time of year, more than any other, people want to come to church. I know that. It's either Easter or it's Christmas, right? And I think people innately know that Christmas is about Christ. It's about the risen king or about Jesus being born, right? And so they want to come to service. That's just what they want to do. And so when you're asking them, instead of going, well, I'll think about it, what you're going to get is, wow, thanks. I'll think, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe me and my family can come, right? So you're going you're gonna to find that you're going to meet with not resistance, but people loving the fact that you gave them the opportunity. They do not want to come by themselves, by the way. Right? And most of us can identify with that. So when you give them that card and you say, I'll meet you here, that, that helps. We've given you three service choices because we want you to be inviting people in the community to come and to learn about the true meaning of Jesus Christ in the Christmas spirit and what it is exactly. Okay? All right. So you have that opportunity. The next thing here that I want to bring to your attention is that this time of year, more than any other also, what happens with people at the Christmas season is some kind of like dial that gets turned up, the volume. Everything in their life becomes almost like a, um, a megaphone, right? And so if they're doing really well, then the season's fun, and it's, you know, they're walking through it. But if they're not doing well, the megaphone gets turned up in that too with the losses and the different things going on, and it feels so huge, and I want to draw you back to this last scripture because this is where I want to tell you where your joy is found no matter where you are. In Philippians 4, 4, it says, be full of joy in the Lord always. And circle that, in the Lord. Be full of joy in the Lord always. I say it again, be full of joy. And so our joy is not found in circumstances. It's not found in Christmas, yet it is found in Jesus Christ. That is who the author of our faith is. That is, if you are missing joy this morning, he has given you that gift and you just need to go and unwrap it and he will help you because he loves you and he cares about you. Now bow your heads with me. I'm going to close this in prayer. Yes, Father. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would continue to come and yeah, I thank you, Father. I thank you for this, uh, this time of year and the joy, Lord, that you bring us. I thank you for those beautiful, beautiful children, Lord. I hear that. Father, may we be like those kids. May we just come unabandonedly, unashamedly, and may we line up. We might not have the best voices, and what, it doesn't matter. We just line up, and we sing out for all to hear, Lord. May we be like those little ones. Father, again... I thank you. I thank you for your mercy and your love. Yeah. And so those of you who have come in here and, and I've talked to you about a relationship, I've talked to you about God calling out to you. I have to stop here while everybody's head is bowed and they're praying uh, for their own things. I'm going to ask you if you want this relationship with Jesus Christ, right? You want to answer this call that Father God has to you, then you can just pray right where you're at. You can just say right here, and you say, Father God, go ahead. Father God, I'll understand everything, but I'm answering your call today. Jesus, forgive me for my sins, and I accept you as my Savior, and I ask you to be the leader of my life. Let me understand the true meaning of Christmas. I choose to answer the call today. Yeah. 
Father says that he seals this in your heart and he has written your name in the book of life. Now, Father God, I ask that you would also cover them and put your Holy Spirit in them, Father, that they might find uh, their way, Lord, in that decision. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are moving amongst us, Lord God. And um, yeah, Father, you showed me the spirit of heaviness and depression. And so if that's you today, I want to I wanna just call out to you specifically. I'm not going to call you by name. I'm not going to ask you to do something. But I've been praying for you. And so I want you to know that God wants your mind to be transformed. Prozac and stuff like that, that's okay. But he says the only true peace is found in him and unpackaging. So if you're struggling emotionally this morning, then I just want you to take hold of that and say, here, give it to, give it to the Lord. Say, here's my depression. Here's my discouragement. Here's my anxiety. Here's my great sadness. I'm giving it to you. And I'm choosing today to pick up this gift of, of the good news and of salvation, the joy. And I'm choosing to unwrap that again. Help me, Holy Spirit, to pull that into myself, to accept what you alone can give. Now, Father, for those that were praying that prayer, I ask that you'd seal it in their heart, Lord, and that this day, going forward, that they would begin to see a switch in their lives, Lord. I thank you that you wanted to give them a power encounter that they didn't even think they were going to have today. So I thank you, Lord Jesus. And Father, I thank you that your mercy can cover anything, Lord. And so you are faithful. And we love you. Yeah, I hear that. We will, we will choose to love you, Father, with all our heart, all our mind, with all our soul, and with every breath that you've given us. We're going, to, we're going to poise ourselves, Father, to hear you and to follow you, to obey you, to tell others. We're going to choose to do that, Lord, because that's what you ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.